Hello, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host of Fiber Chats. And today my guest is Meredith. Okay, let's talk about your last name. How do you say that? <laughs> it is a mouthful. Uh, my last name is pronounced Woolnuff, like enough wool to make a jumper. <laughs> Can you tell I used to be a high school teacher? <laughs> Well, what, what did you used to teach? Let's talk about that. Um, oh, so I used to teach all the fun, messy things. So art, uh, photography, and of course, textiles and design. So at some point you were studying um, art. How did you discover embroidery? Like why embroidery? Yeah, so the particular type of embroidery that I do, so that's uh, freehand machine embroidery, which is essentially drawing with a sewing machine, and I work exclusively on water-soluble fabric. I probably couldn't stitch on fabric to save my life. So that technique was introduced to me when I studied fine art. So I did a fine art degree straight out of high school, um, majored in textiles, and it was during my honours year of that degree that I focused on that really specific style of embroidery. I spent a whole year playing with it, making all the mistakes and uh, kind of fell in love with it during that year and have kept going. Right. So that's how I found embroidery. But like when you started embroidery, did you know that this technique exists? Like, did you see it somewhere? Did you sort of reinvent the whole thing yourself? How did that happen? Sure. Um, well, I don't think anything's completely invented. <laughs> um, I was certainly aware of freehand machine embroidery. That was something that I was introduced at uni. But it wasn't something that anyone there did or did well. It was just one of many techniques we were kind of quickly shown. And before that, I really didn't know much about embroidery. I think I had done, you know, maybe some little cross stitch or long stitch kits when I was a kid. You know, I liked the like meditative process of hand embroidery, but I'd never done it on a machine. I really didn't know much about the sewing machine at all. I think I'd maybe sewn a pencil case in my life. Um, but I saw it as just a really interesting way to draw and I actually still see my work and consider my work drawing it's just an unconventional type of drawing so I loved that I could turn my sewing machine into a drawing tool and I was in control of where I could put down the stitches because I love the look of a stitched line even just on fabric and in my early days at uni before I sort of really focused on it in my honours year I used to take a sewing machine into life drawing classes um, which the rest of the class probably hated because <laughs> it was this noisy clunky thing in the back of the room um, but they were all like cool art students so they didn't complain about it um, and yeah I just always saw it, saw it as a very cool way to draw and then when I learned about water soluble fabric so water soluble fabric is essentially it looks like a sheet of interfacing um, but if you put it in water it washes away and it's commonly used just as a stabilizer so if you were trying to do embroidery onto a delicate fabric or just fabric that's challenging to stitch onto so if you were trying to embroider a monograph on a on a towel or something that would get moved around and all chewed up by the machine a layer of this will stabilize it give you a nice embroidery and then unlike uh, a tear away uh, interfacing or an interfacing that stays there as a patch on the back of your embroidery this is washable so it dissolves when you wash it in water like it's never there but the way that I use it is a bit different so I use it as a base fabric all on its own not without any other form of fabric and that allows me to really make my thread drawings where they, they don't have the limitation of a base fabric anymore. They're kind of liberated from their base fabric. So I can create lace-like drawings with lots of negative space in them. And then I can shape and mold those drawings so they're not flat um, like they would maybe be if they were on a flat piece of fabric. I can make them three-dimensional and sculptural and kind of bring new life to it. So I just saw so much potential in that. Um, and I think that's why I really chose to focus on it, even though, prior to doing that I really had no experience in it so it was kind of a leap of faith but thankfully it's um it's paid off I still love it so let's talk about drawing so I have two part question right so one <laughs> is do you have to be a good artist to do what you do just because I saw that you teach uh freehand embroidery so let's say somebody who can only draw stick figures come to your class can they oh yeah absolutely Absolutely. It's one of the wonderful things of it. And sometimes the really scrappy, messy drawings are the ones that turn out the best because they, they kind of take on a life of their own with this technique, particularly when you take the base fabric away, sometimes they'll shrivel up or move into really interesting shapes. I never really considered myself very skilled in drawing, 
even though I studied fine arts and I had a whole degree in art, I spent all my time in textiles and playing with thread and yarn and dyeing and this embroidery. I didn't really hone down on drawing. Um, so my early experiments were not really, even though I see it as drawing, it was drawing in a very basic, almost naive way, repetitive shapes and building up structures in threads. And that was really exciting. Since then, I've gone on specifically to get better at drawing, both you know with pencil or paint and in my embroidery. And I went on and studied an entirely different degree. Many years later, as a mature age student, I went on and did a natural history illustration degree because I wanted to fill in those gaps and get better at drawing. And that's definitely helped me in my practice. And I love drawing, traditional drawing. Um, but it's definitely not necessary. Um, you know, the only way you get better at something is to do it. And this is drawing, just like with a pen and paper, you're just using a sewing machine instead. Have uh, have you ever broke through that fabric? Through the like torn it fabric? or? Yeah, like, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like when it's you quite... draw on it or when you saw this, it like, does it happen? Yes, it does. So like any medium, it comes with its challenges. It comes with some limitations that you have to find ways to work around. The fabric itself is quite delicate. Um, it will tear if you're a bit heavy handed with it, but I've got sort of strategies of how to protect the fabric from tearing. And of course, like anything, as you work with something more and more, you become really familiar with it. And I know when I'm pushing its limits, I know when it's about to tear and I can take steps to avoid that. So I rarely have that problem myself anymore. Right. So I saw some of your first uh, projects um, somewhere on internet and they, they had this watercolor technique. So it was embroidery on top of watercolor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, did, that takes me back. <laughs> and you mentioned that like you still had those pieces somewhere. Ooh, so do you, do you, um, ever do it again, like now that you combine different mediums so did you became like an exclusively embroidery person sure well I guess it depends what you consider your practice I'm known for my embroidery art that's what I make and sell that's what I exhibit that's my world but that's definitely not the only art form that I explore and and sort of create with um, so there's always a lot of research and lead up work often in my work, like I said, a lot of traditional drawing and sketching. And as I said, I've got that natural history illustration degree under my belt as well. And as a result of that, I learned botanical illustration and, you know, scientific illustration and, you know, fine watercolor painting. And although I often don't have the time to do that a lot, it's still something that I love to do. I often, yeah, paint with watercolor, draw uh, acrylic paint occasionally um, for my own pleasure, but also as the sort of lead up and race up research almost um to lead towards my embroidery designs if that makes sense and that's right. something that I really enjoy as well but you often don't see that in the final work and you get inspired a lot by nature because I see a lot of leaves and flowers in your work like corals and there's mm -hmm. like all kinds of things um and then you take also pictures of it or videos of it how do you study it basically like do you do you try to copy it or do you try to improvise with what you see so you sort of ask that what's my process from start to finish yeah yeah well in an ideal world when I can actually get out beyond the, uh, I'm in the five kilometer lockdown radius at the moment um I I do have a, a field work based sort of process where I do love to go out and find things that inspire me, whether that's things in the ocean. I love to scuba dive when I can. If not, I love to bushwalk and I'm, I'm lucky to be surrounded by just some beautiful natural environments here in Australia. And uh, I'll find things that I'm interested in. I will, like you said, I'll take photographs of them. Uh, sometimes if it's permitted, I'll even take uh, specimens if it's sort of plants that I'm allowed to take. Um, things like that, that I can study in a bit more detail. I really love to understand what it is that I'm depicting. Normally I'll be drawn to something for a particular reason. Like I might be drawn to the leaf veins inside um, a particular plant specimens, the patterns that are made by those veins, or I might be drawn to a particular species of coral for its color or for its interesting structure or whatever it is. Um, but then I like to learn as much as I can about it. I'm a little bit of a science nerd like that. So I'll do a lot of research. I'll try and find out exactly what I'm looking at. and 
and pull together a lot of resources. Sometimes that'll mean um, sourcing other imagery of the same thing, not just my own. And I'm basically trying to put together like a little packet of information and develop a, a good deep understanding of my subject matter. And then when it comes time to creating that in my stitched interpretation, sometimes it might be very literal. Like I might find a leaf that I'm just obsessed with and I will map out every internal vein in that leaf. But other times it might be a bit more abstracted and I, I'm trying to depict the thing that fascinates me most or that I find most beautiful about that particular organism. So if it's the color of a particular plant or a particular leaf or the changes in color of a particular leaf, maybe that's what I focus on. And I might uh, sort of adjust and change the design so that it's going to be possible in the type of embroidery that I do, but still depict that plant in a faithful way and uh, pull out its best bits and display the, the things that I find most interesting and most beautiful about it. So I saw a couple of the things where you blend colors and it looks almost like watercolor, but it made this thread. <laughs> How do you achieve that? Like, is that your own technique or is that something like common? Yeah, yeah, well, that's, you're right. That's, you've nailed it. That's definitely something that I try to do in my work because again, I, I do come from this art background. I did have a painting background before I really delved into textiles. And when you paint, you can mix up any color you want. <laughs> and of course you can then blend colors beautifully. But when you're working with embroidery threads, unless you're gonna dye the threads yourself, you know, you have to work in the colors that they're manufactured in. And um, and then often the transition between colors in your stitching, you know, can be quite jarring. And I never liked that. So quite early on, almost by accident, you know, I discovered that I could blend two colors together by tweaking my tension and making it so that you could see if I'm stitching with two different colors on my, one on my top and one on my bottom bobbin thread, I can kind of blend them together in my stitching. And I sort of developed a sequence of fine tuning that and an order of which I lay down colors so that I get a smooth transition between colors. It's not that one color stops and another one starts. There's a, a couple of blending modes, I suppose. And uh, that's something that I love to incorporate in my work. And it's probably something that my work's quite well known for um, is that blending of colors. And it doesn't always just have to be blending of similar colors. You can even blend completely complementary colors, opposite colors, and it still works. So. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I saw you had a hundred pieces of embroidery exhibit. How long yeah. did it take you to prepare for that exhibit? A whole year, pretty much. <laughs> so that so last year I did uh, that. It was a hundred embroideries project, and it was quite ambitious to take on, but also it was really a great creative project. So um, I had an exhibition booked in. Around about the time that exhibition was happening, I was also due to have a baby, my second daughter. So it's like I had this hard deadline and I was like, okay, I want to, you know, I know things are going to slow down and change once that second baby comes along. So I want to, you know, I want to do something significant for this show. So I decided to do this 100 Embroideries project. The show was in August and I committed to doing it, I think in January. So I had however long that was. And um yeah, so the, the goal was not to do an embroidery a day. That, would be, that wouldn't have been possible, um, the amount of work that's still involved. But um, these are small embroideries. They're probably only about 10 centimetres in diameter each, framed up. They were 20 by 20. They were very cute. Actually, do I have a little? I don't have one from that, that range here, but I have one that's the same size. So this is the size of them. And we just like cute little, little embroideries. Um, so, yeah, and the goal of that, project you know creating a hundred pieces I knew that was going to push me there were there were kind of familiar subject matters and familiar things that I love to make and I'm known for I'm known for stitching ginkgo leaves and coral and certain certain leaves and plants but I, I wanted to kind of push myself into making new things as well and I saw that project as a great way to do that and because they were small there wasn't too much pressure on each one so yeah, I just kind of had a year of making all these little pieces and um, it was good for the first half of the project. I had heaps of ideas. And then when I got to about the second half, that's when I really started scraping the bo bottom of the barrel. But also, you know, it just kept pushing me to go, okay, well, what else can I do? What else can I make? What else can I explore? And it was a really great um, project to do that year. I'm hoping to do something again like that in the future because it, it really pushed me. It was great. Well, let me ask you about the balancing act. 
So you have a <laughs> little kid, mm. you're running this studio, you're teaching classes online. Um, how? <laughs> uh, good question. Time management? prioritizing it's always a juggle um now really I only have a couple of days a week so I've got two kids uh, two girls uh, a little ball of energy that's four and then my youngest is now just one um and of course when they're with me they take up all my time um, my eldest is in daycare three days a week and then my youngest as of two weeks ago, is now in daycare one day a week. But before that, she was with me 24-7 and I work when she sleeps. So on the days when my elder daughter was in daycare, there are days we go into the studio, she goes down for a nap, I work. She wakes up, we play, she goes down for a nap, I work. So I just had to be really efficient. I had to know what I was doing in that time and I had to be prepared to stop at any moment. And for a while it was really frustrating, especially when I know how productive I was before having kids or with only having one child. But you know, that's just life, isn't it? I just had to learn to slow down and to say no to things and to step back. Um, and that's also why I sort of moved to online teaching as well. I used to teach a lot of workshops, a lot which involved traveling, you know, within Australia, um, a few little ones overseas. I did have a big one booked in for Canada until COVID happened. Um, but, you know, they take a lot of time and energy and, you know, I've got to be away from my family for that time. So that really forced my push into to doing things online and developing online courses. And it's been wonderful because I've been able to also then open up teaching to people all over the world and um, people who I couldn't get to before, um, you know, I can now work with and I love it. So that's been definitely part of the juggling act as well. How did you change as an instructor, as a, as a teacher, from like the first class you gave to where you are today? Sure. Well, I think well, I, I had that background in teaching. So I studied fine arts, then I went on and did teaching, taught in high schools for a while. So I sort of was always comfortable getting up and talking in front of a class. And then when it came, when I moved away from teaching in schools and I focused entirely on my art practice, when it came to teaching workshops, you know, I was teaching something that I knew so well and that I was so passionate about. Um, so I, I really like teaching workshops, but they've definitely evolved with me. Of course, I've learned the best way to deliver the, the techniques and the information so that the students get the most out of it. And then, you know, sort of fine tune that down into a, a two day workshop where people can kind of get the head around the bulk of the way that I work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then when it went to transitioning to longer workshops, um, you know, putting more into it, covering more ground. And then of course, with the online courses, that's a, the, the online course, the main one that I teach is a six week program. So, you know, it's great because people really get to go through step by step and, and, and really get proficient at each point and then develop their own work as well. And um, yeah, I absolutely love it. I, I don't think there's some, a lot of artists that teach that maybe don't really enjoy teaching or, um, you know, it's, it's not something that comes really naturally to them, but I've always, I've always enjoyed teaching. So mm -hmm. whatever medium it is, whichever, whether it's in person or online, I really like it. So who would be your typical student? Oh, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Um, I think obviously people who are interested in, in sewing already or embroidery already seem to be drawn to me. People who are proficient with their sewing machine, you know, seem to, to do quite well. But I've also had people who have never done anything like this turn up in my workshops. They're just like, I really liked your work. I thought it was interesting. I bought a sewing machine. Can you show me how to thread it up? And I'm like, oh, this is fabulous. Um, right in the deep end. Cause that's how I started. I was like, I see this is an exciting way to work. Don't know how to do it, but I'll figure it out. Um, and that's what I did. So uh, I do attract some complete beginners who are actually sometimes the best students because they don't have any ingrained sort of bad habits or, or things like that. They're just like sponges and they just want to suck it all up. Um, but then I also get these people who have, you know, careers as dressmakers or are already textile artists. Um, and, and they, they also, you know, there's always something new to learn, right? Learning another person's process. So I get a lot of those and I always get a lot of teachers. There's always at least one teacher in every <laughs> workshop. <laughs> teachers never stop learning. It's great. Right. 
do you ever get a student who gets like overwhelmed or super frustrated with the course because especially like now that it's online and you can't physically help them yeah yeah and that's you know in a face-to-face -face workshop or even in an online workshop you know that's always tough for them and for me because this is a tricky technique it's not just like a you know, you, you program something in, press a button and away it goes. You're in control of everything. You're kind of pushing the sewing machine to its limits and working with challenging materials. And sometimes stuff goes wrong. Technical things go wrong with the sewing machine, things that you can't explain. Um, and it's really tough, particularly online when you can't sort of sit down and try and work through the problems with a student. But my thing is more about setting them up in a way so that they won't have those problems and giving them a good understanding of how to work their machine, how to work and understand tension, not be scared of that, all those sorts of things so that no matter what happens, there's a way around it. I have like a 10 step checklist. It's like, okay, if things go wrong, start at step one and then work your way through and nine times out of 10, you'll you'll solve the problem along the way. But it is a challenge of, of online learning um, is that you're not physically there, but I just try to make myself as accessible as possible and break down those barriers that you sometimes get with online learning as best I can, realistically. Have you ever had a student that just blew your mind with what they achieved at the end of the six weeks course? Oh, all the time. <laughs> it's my favorite part. Oh, it's because my thing when, when I teach a course, I'm not teaching a project based course, there's projects in the course, but I'm always encouraging people like this is a starting point, take it further. Because the way that I work with these techniques, the little path I've gone down is really just a little narrow path of the huge pie of possibilities. I only, I only take a tiny slice. There's so many things you can do with it. And of course, everyone who comes to a workshop has their own background they might have other skills so I love it when I see students combine it with things they already know so you know I've had milliners take my courses and then produce these hats with these beautiful embellishments or there'll be quilters and they'll have all these other skills and they'll just incorporate this style of embroidery into a beautiful bigger project and then yeah it's my favorite part is to see what people do and then how delighted they are with what they make because they come in thinking oh we're just gonna do these little things and then they realize oh no now that I understand the technique and the way I can approach it, understand the possibilities and limitations of this technique. Now I can kind of make anything and it's three dimensional. So I can really make anything. I've just got to figure out how to do it. And um, yeah, it's, it's great. I had uh, quite a number of students in the last time I ran the course who made the most beautiful things. One woman made this beautiful, like three dimensional gum blossom specimen. Cause she said that she um, loves uh, pink gum blossoms. They're a native flower here. She can't grow them. She's killed a couple of them, but now she's made her specimen. So she's got it all the time. And yeah, there's been lots of great projects like that. It's the most rewarding part for me. Have there ever been complete disasters? Oh yeah, occasionally, but nothing's ever a disaster. Even if things don't work out, you learn so much. You learn more from your failures than from your successes. If stuff just worked out all the time, it would be boring um, and you would never move forward. So, you know, sometimes things don't work out, but I don't think anything's ever a waste. Even if something doesn't work out, even particularly with these processes, you can cut it up, you can repurpose it, you can reuse it, you know, nothing's ever a complete disaster. Sometimes things don't go to plan, but nothing's ever a complete waste. So when I was looking at how you dip it into the water, right, right. and take it out, it's still sort of, and you squeeze it pretty hard. Oh yeah, you don't have to be gentle yeah. with them. <laughs> right. And it yeah. still sort of holds the shape. Like, yeah. does it ever completely loses shape or does it mean that you didn't stitch enough if it, if it does? Yeah. So. This is like the biggest lesson of working on water soluble fabric. You've got to remember water soluble fabric is just a temporary surface for your drawing. Whatever you stitch, whatever you design, it's got to be well connected and it's got to be made in a way that once you take that base fabric away, it's going to do what you want or it's going to stay in the shape that you want. And of course, there's like techniques that we have for supporting delicate drawings and for pinning them out and shaping them. But if, if your design's not connected properly, once you take that base fabric away, it, it will fall apart. And that's a really common problem. People try this technique for the first time. They spend all this time stitching something. They're so excited about it. And then they dissolve it and it all just falls apart or it gets holes and they end up with just this gluey tangle of snotty threads in their hands. And they're just 
a bit heartbroken and they feel like they've wasted all this time and energy and money and then they never do it again. And I just think that's such a shame because like, as I've said, there's so many opportunities in this technique. There's so many great ways that you can work with it once you know how to work with it. So if there's any lesson that I really want to hammer home to my students or to anyone even listening to this, if you're working with these techniques, you know, you've got to make sure that that design is, you're thinking about the design, knowing that the fabric's going to go away. And you've got to think through every stage of the design process because it's not the same as doing a drawing or doing a freehand drawing on fabric where the fabric's going to always hold it out. You know, your fabric's disappearing. So yeah, as long as you have that concept in your brain, you're on the right track. So I also noted, so the class itself is not outrageously expensive. I mean, it sounds reasonable to me, right? Because it's six mm -hmm. weeks, it's a lot of material, a lot of videos, a lot of time. But then they also have to buy the, like, let's say a complete beginner comes, they have to invest in the sewing machine and the threads mm -hmm. and whatever. Is that expensive, like upfront cost to get yeah. into that craft? Well, the most expensive part would be a sewing machine. You know, uh, that's, unfortunately, that's not something I can send someone in a kit, um, you know, and there's a huge range in terms of prices of sewing machines. You can do this technique on a really basic machine because it's actually a really basic technique, even the, the really cheap ones, but like anything, quality is super important in a sewing machine. So I think that's why I tend to attract people who already have a sewing machine because, you know, to be like, okay, to buy a good sewing machine, if it's thousands of dollars, that's off-putting. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I am a big fan of secondhand machines. The machine that I learned on um, for this technique, I did my whole honors year. It was on an ex-high school sewing machine. It actually has school socks spelt incorrectly, <laughs> scratched into the top of it. It looks terrible as chunks out. Of, it's, it's an old machine. It's older than me. I picked it up for a hundred bucks. It was refurbished from like a machine mechanic. And it still works beautifully. <laughs> I did my whole honors year on it. I've since upgraded to some newer and more beautiful, beautiful machines that have better lights and a few more bells and whistles, but you don't need anything fancy. And then in terms of the materials themselves, water soluble fabrics about $10 a meter. It's not very expensive. Threads, yeah, good quality threads are important, but you know, you can pick up threads for, you know, 10 bucks a spool. And then really all you need is uh, a few other bits and pieces, most of which you have at home already pins, scissors, baking paper, something to mold around. There's actually not a lot. And when I do my, um, run my courses, I actually put together little kits. So if people have a hard time tracking it down, um, you know, if it's easier, they can just buy it from me. And then it's got my favorite hoop in it, the threads that I use, the fabric that I use, the molds we use in the course. I just try and make it easy for people. It's not necessary. They don't need to buy that. Most people already have these things if they're already sewers, but I do try and make it as easy as possible because I just want people to have fun with it. I don't want people to have a nightmare trying to track down these things. Well, I have related question, but like money related question again, right? When you try to sell it, do people mm. ever tell you, well, it's only thread and soluble paper that you can buy for $10 a meter? And the spoon of the, like, <laughs> do people ever qu question your pricing? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think the same argument could be said for any artwork. You know, if you have a drawing, you're like, oh, it's paper and a lead pencil. You know, I could buy that. Um, but I think when it comes to pricing, you know, that's always a, a tricky thing. I'm lucky that um, I have no problem selling my work. I have problems keeping up with the demand. Um, you know, when I did that 100 embroideries project last year, they all sold. <laughs> it was it was crazy. Um so yeah, but in saying that, um, you know, pricing of art is always so subjective. Um, and that's something in particular with textile arts. There is a lot of people who make textile arts who don't sell them for very much, um, probably maybe because they love them and they just see it as a hobby. But, you know, this is my job. This is my profession. I've been doing this for 16 or 17 years now. Um, and, you know, you know, I'm lucky now that I'm in a position where people want my work. And they also, even though the materials might not be expensive, I think people can appreciate the labor in the work. They can see the time, the effort, the love, the skill that comes from doing something for a long time. And also the work's so unique, people aren't used to seeing it. So it's definitely got that point of difference. Um, and that's definitely worked in my favor. It's becoming more and more popular, which is I think it's great that more people know about this technique and it's out there. And that's also why I love to teach it because I just think 
so much fun can be had with it and so many things can be done with it. So it's great that more people are doing it and right. it's getting out there more, but it's still, it's still pretty niche. It's still, every time I'll do a show, the people who just, they're like, I've never seen anything like this. Right. And, and that definitely helps when it comes to producing something or an artwork that, that people love. Yeah. Well, so when I'm thinking embroidery, right, a flat picture comes to mind, like a piece of mm. silk with some dragon on it, like something like yep. that. <laughs> but <laughs> then I look at your embroidery and there's like whole sculptures and it's like, they like very three-dimensional. So you're actually doing what you call like sculptural embroidery, right? How does mm. that affect, how do you achieve that? The, the shaping and the molding right. yeah, as opposed to flat. Yep. So it really comes down to the fabric itself. So the water soluble fabric that I use is um, made of the same sort of stuff as PVA glue, polyvinyl alcohol fibers. So um, it's quite gluey. And normally when you use it as a stabilizer, you completely wash it out, mm -hmm. but I don't do that. I sort of have a fine balance where I wash enough of it out so that you don't have any left and you don't have any residue, but I leave enough of it trapped in there that some of those glue-like properties come into action. So I can shape and mold and stretch my embroideries around molds or even just sort of let them curl up and dry on their own or I can press them completely flat that's still a way of molding even though it's flat and then when they dry that glueiness of the water soluble fabric that's still trapped in the fibers rehardens, and that helps it to hold its shape right. <laughs> what's the like funkiest most unusual thing you've made oh that is a good question um I think people who come to me like they like what I do so they tend to ask me to make things that are along my vein but I have had a few people who just have interesting color combinations so I, I remember I did have a lady who wanted a you know a design based off a lily plant sort of thing but she wanted these colors she wanted duck egg blue lovely and then like um acid yellow which is like high vis yellow <laughs> and she wanted those colors blended together and I was just like wow that's a that's a combo. Like, how am I going to make that work? But surprisingly, it did. Again, it comes down to that color blending process. Like, who would have thought, you know, beautiful muted duck egg blue and vibrant, intense yellow would go together in an image of a leaf and not look weird? Right. It, it kind of did. And that's one thing that I do like about commission work is it sometimes asks me to push things further and to make new things. So at the moment, I'm working on a commission based off cushion plants, um, which are these amazing little tiny things that grow in like alpine areas, particularly in Tasmania here in Australia. They're beautiful. But, you know, looking at that, it's sort of, okay, how do I make that in my style of embroidery so that it looks good? It still looks like my work. Technically, it's going to work. And, you know, it's going to give the, the customer sort of a, what they want. And, you know, that's something that I probably, although I love those plants, I've seen them, I've taken heaps of photo of them, photographs of them myself, myself, but then I never push myself to make an artwork on them out of that particular subject matter. But now I am. And that uh, it's it's a really exciting way to work because it does push you to work in a totally different way and to see what's possible. So I also saw like you had a post about making um, daisies. And you said like oh, yep. you never made daisies before, and then somebody commissioned <laughs> you to make daisies. Do you ever doubt that you can do something? Like when a person yep. calls you, they ask you like, "Can you make me a picture with daisies?" Does it stumble you for a second? Do you like, "Oh my god!" Like, how the heck do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> yep, all the time. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, you know, with this technique there there are possibilities and limitations for everything so you know if someone comes to me with something like that um normally what I'll be like oh that's interesting leave it with me and see what I'll see what I can do so you know even at the moment I had someone approach me the other day that wanted this particular thing at this particular size and I'm like oh I don't know if it's possible but leave it with me and I'll see what will happen um and rather than making them commit to anything or me commit to anything and I'm really happy to do that work you know, for free and say, okay, yeah, let me see if I can make a daisy or whatever it is. And then, and then we go from there and it's exciting for me, but yeah, it's also sometimes it's like, oh gosh, that's, that's going to be really tricky. Um, but that's where the magic sort of happens as well. So when you talk about the daisies and any flowers, actually, 
I've made so few flowers. <laughs> Every flower that I've ever made has been at the request of somebody else. So I recently also made some hydrangeas. Um, and again, uh, that was not something that I probably would have made myself, but this person, you know, had a particular connection with hydrangea flowers and loved them. And so I was like, okay, let me see what I can do. And um, yeah, I was really happy with what I ended up making. And so were they. So it's those sorts of situations that push you further. And that's, that's always exciting. Did anybody ever ask you to make like a little mermaid or some cartoon character? <laughs> Asked me to do a portrait of their dog once. Um, and uh, I politely refused uh, just because, yeah, some, there's some things where it's just like, have you seen my work? Yeah, I, yeah no, that, that's not, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, it's sweet of them to ask, but also no. <laughs> You mentioned at, um, in one of your blogs that you learn as a mother to say no and that it's like very important for everybody, but like artists specifically, to be able to say no. Um, mm. How do you prioritize what you say yes to and what you say no to, and especially when it comes to the artistic things like this, right? Like something safe versus something that takes you completely out of your comfort zone. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. Um, and I think it, for me, learning to say no is being realistic with the time I have available. So if if you know if I I've committed to something, whether it's a commission or an exhibition, I know I only have a few days a week to work on it. And within those few days, sometimes it's only an hour or so. So I and I I know how much I can achieve in that time. Um, and if something comes my way that I don't think I can fit in, I just have to say no to it. And um, particularly this year, you know, with the two kids and everything, I, you know, my commission books have been officially closed all year. I've just been sort of working on things that people have asked me about um, in the past. Um, and it's hard because I, I often want to take all these things on. And particularly if they're new and challenging things, I want to do them. I want to push myself further. But if I don't feel I can do something well, then I probably won't take it on because at the end of the day, I want to be happy with the work I create. And of course, I want the collectors to be happy as well. And if I just don't feel I can do it justice or I just don't have the time that will be needed to, you know, doing all the trial and error, then yeah, I'll have to say no. And I'm getting better at it. <laughs> I'm getting better at it. Do you remember your first uh, sold piece? I sure do. So the first exhibition where I really exhibited work of this style was where I sold the first thing to like a stranger, to like not like someone in my family. Um, so it was an, a group show. I was teaching at the time, but I was trying to sort of work as an artist on the side. I never kind of gave that up and I'd be stitching at night and in my school holidays. And I was asked to be part of this group exhibition. There were 20 artists in the show. The show was called Petite because it's 20 of us. We could only make small work. And I made nine. Actually, the, the size works are still one of my favorite sizes because I made them in my favorite size embroidery hoop and they were all coral structures because I'd recently learned to scuba dive and I was obsessed with coral um and it was also the first time I developed my like mounting technique the way that I mount them so they kind of float in the frame and so I had these nine pieces and it was sort of my first official show big opening all of that sort of stuff and I sold I think three or four of the nine on opening night um and that just was like, oh my goodness, like people actually want this, you know, this, that's, that's, I love it, this type of embroidery, but it is so different. And, you know, in an exhibition with painters and sculptors and more traditional forms of art, I'm sort of wondering, you know, how's this textile art going to be seen here? Is it going to be taken seriously? But of the show, I sold more, more work than anybody. So, you know, it was obviously some different enough and interesting enough that um, it struck a chord with people. And, and that, that, show that those sales I think really gave me the confidence to keep going and to work bigger and to work more and you know eventually leave my teaching job and now this is all I do and right. I love it. <laughs> have you ever had the moment of like disappointment doubt like when something didn't work out when you thought you're gonna sell something when there was like negative uh, reply from the customer, something broke. I don't know, like, is it always that easy and that 
amazing. No, no, I, <laughs> yeah, no, it's never that easy, is it? I probably make it sound wonderful. And I've had some wonderful like interactions and with people. And generally people buy my work because they love it. Um, they buy it because they want to live with it. And that's the most rewarding thing. But, you know, it's interesting. I always find it interesting where you, if you're like a fly on the wall in an exhibition, and, you know, hearing people talk about it and, you know, they just don't get it or they don't like it. That's fine. Not everyone has to like it. So there's always those sorts of people. And quite often those people and their comments like really get to you. They really kind of like hit you in the heart. And it's generally because people don't really understand what they're looking at, um, which is fine as well. It's all about educating people. But it's, it's that common thing. You could have 100 people tell you your work is beautiful and they love it, but it's just that one person that's like, this is a piece of crap. I can't believe she charges that much for it. Like she, she just drew that on a sewing machine. Uh, and, you know, and that's the one that like, oh, I, I actually had a situation where um, I was a guest artist at a craft and quilt fair back before COVID shut everything down. And I was there, you know, demonstrating and there was all these people standing around. And this, um, this lady sort of said really loudly, she's like, yeah, but you're not doing anything. It's the machine doing all the work there. <laughs> And I was just sort of like, oh, and there was actually another girl, like another lady in the audience who just said, no, this is all done freehand. She might make it look easy because she's been doing it for a long time. It takes a lot of skill to do this type of work. And I was just like this stunned person, like sitting behind the sewing machine. But so it was like, while that person's comment was a bit maybe rude, the other little cheer squad that kind of told her off for it was actually kind of like, Thank you. <laughs> but yeah. No, actually, when I was watching you use that machine, I mean, my heart stopped like for like good. <laughs> because to me, this is like, it looks like Mission Impossible. Like the way you move it, the way, like you manhandling that machine. It's not like really... <laughs> I have had a lot of practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it probably, like anything, you know, you watch someone who's used a pottery wheel. I look at that and just think it's like wizardry. Um, you do something long enough, you, you, you get to a point where you make it look really easy. Um, but yeah. <laughs> have you ever got injured by a machine? No, I haven't. I've never put a needle through my finger and I'm very proud to say I have never had a student do it either. Um, even when I taught in schools. So no, um, probably, yeah, no, I don't think so. Maybe the odd pinprick from mounting works. But other than that, that's about it. It's one of the reasons why I chose this particular medium as well. Um, it's a safe medium. It's not a messy medium. I'm not working with any sort of heavy chemicals or dangerous paints or things like that. So it's it's good long-term. Quite a few people that I went through art school with or at least lecturers that I knew from art school are now really affected by sort of the heavy metals and cadmiums and paint and things like that, um, which is really scary and even dyes and things like that as well. We know we have to be really careful of. So it's one of the reasons why I chose this technique. My biggest thing is the ergonomics, taking care of myself and making sure that I'm sitting properly at the sewing machine so I don't mess up my back. <laughs> well, can we talk a little bit about your helpers? So there is all these like videos of the baby reorganizing all day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, does that actually messes you up? Like, do you ever get frustrated that you can't find things because the kids were playing in your studio? <laughs> all the time, more at home than anything. Um, I my studio is separate from my house. I need to go to work, so I have a separate studio space. And when I go there with a, a helper, um, it's generally only one of them. And, you know, she's only however high. So although she can now get into the second level of my threads and she's very good at reorganizing my threads for me, her sister was before her as well. That's about as much as she gets into. I've sort of tried to baby proof the studio as much as I can. But also when I am with her there in the studio with her, like I'm with her all the time. She's sort of not pottering around and doing her own thing. I might be standing up at the bench doing something, but she's within sight. So I haven't uh, lost anything that I know of <laughs> so far, but who knows? <laughs> Things can always end up in weird places when you got kids around. Right. Um, do you do any art projects with your older daughter? I mean, I know that the baby is a little bit on the young side from now to be on the sewing machine, but do you, does your older one do anything with any sort of I just, 
yeah just your basic sort of stuff she's really into drawing she does a lot of that you know we've, we've had the odd um you know little painting project she also really likes baking well she likes decorating cakes anyway likes eating icing um but yeah nothing sort of crazy out of the ordinary but yeah she's I think that she's pretty creative she definitely loves to draw and things like that you know kids are always more creative than all of us put together aren't they have you ever tried letting her draw on that dissolvable fabric and then embroider her drawings no but that would be a fun idea maybe because i should I, do that no, because I, <laughs> I saw there is this woman she does watercolor so mm -hmm. she, she has like a little kid like probably like two or three who goes crazy with the watercolors just like with the finger paints whatever and then mom comes back and just does the actual painting on top of it but like using those colors and it's the cutest thing ever so i was thinking that maybe you can play the same way like, oh well maybe i'll give it a go that's actually a really great idea so yeah if i do i'll let you know yeah i'd love to see that one <laughs> what's what are you working on now what's your plans for the end of the rest of this year and like the next year Sure. So uh, at the moment, um, I'm just working on a couple of commissions. So bits and pieces that are in the work, some of those are in early stages. So who knows where they'll end up. Um, and then I'm running my online course again later in the year. So I'm doing a lot of work to sort of uh, refilm some new things for that, add to that, make that uh, even better than it was last time. And that's really, well, here we are in September. So that's really probably going to be the rest of, <laughs> rest of my year at this point. So yeah. When is this course starting? Um, I'm hoping to launch it around the end of the month. So hopefully it'll be uh, sort of enrollments will open end of September. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> we can put all the links here so people can oh, great. if they want to take the course with you. Yeah, yeah. It's so much fun. <laughs> Sounds like it. It sounds like I mean I, I'm really like tempted actually because and I, 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 I never I never ever time. used the sewing machine. Like I think the one time <laughs> I used it, it was like sixth grade or something. For uh, as I said, often the people who know nothing make the best students, and they're most delighted with what they make. Hmm. Well, thank you so very much for being my guest today. I loved really getting to know you and chatting with you. Thank you. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me.